Welcome everybody to the Association of British Neurologists plenary session uh, with Sarah Tabrizzi. My name is Tom Warner, I'm a professor of clinical neurology and I'm the president-elect of the ABN. And just looking at the meeting that's been going on this week, uh, the ABN is delighted to have a long association with the BNA. and It's truly as a thriving neuroscience community, which as neurologists is great because we're at the end where we want to be delivering new therapies for previously incurable diseases. Uh, and it's good to see all the basic science research that will be feeding this translational pipeline. One of the scourges of um, neurology at the moment is neurodegeneration and neurodegenerative diseases, particularly with aging populations in the West, and our inability to actually be able to uh, affect their course. So I'm delighted for this talk to welcome Professor Sarah Tabrizzi, who is a good colleague of mine at UCL and also a friend, and a few words about her. Sarah has genuinely dedicated her professional career uh, into trying to change the course of Huntington's disease and other neurodegenerative disorders. Probably where Huntington's disease is a genetic, incurable disorder, uh, which takes its effect predominantly on the brain, giving it abnormalities of movement, behavior, cognition, and it is ultimately fatal. Sarah herself is uh, director of the UCL Huntington's Disease um, Institute. She is also joint head of department for neurodegenerative diseases at UCL Queen Square Institute of Neurology. And if that isn't enough, she's a principal investigator at the UK Dementia Research Institute and also a consultant neurologist at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery. Sarah's research spans basic science into cell mechanisms for uh, Huntington's disease all the way through to gene modifying effects. But she has a large translational program and we'll be hearing a bit about that today of truly trying to change the therapeutic landscape for Huntington's disease, particularly with genetic therapies. She is the um, first global PI for genetic therapies in Huntington's using antisense oligonucleotides, and you'll hear more about that trial. But I think I can honestly say she's one person who truly exemplifies taking bench to bedside in a successful way. So I think enough of that. I'll introduce Sarah in just one second, other than say, please, please, if you've got questions, put them up on the chat so we can talk about them after Sarah's finished. Uh, and it's always great to have a bit more interaction. Um, so enjoy the talk and I'll hand over now to Professor Sarah Tabrizzi. Thank you for inviting me to talk to you about new genetic therapies for neurodegeneration. I have just some disclosures. In the past two years, through the offices of UCL Consulting, I've undertaken consultancy for Roche, Genentech, and Takeda. Huntington's disease is a devastating genetic dementia. It's the world's most common genetic dementia. It's monogenic, fully penetrant, and incurable. This is a lady aged 38 with early Huntington's disease, and this is her 13 years later with advanced disease. It affects people in the prime of life with an average age of onset of 42. 
It is caused by a CAG repeat expansion in the first exon of the Huntington gene, encoding a protein, mutant Huntington, that causes disease through a predominant toxic gain of function. This is a video of a lady with Huntington's disease. And you can see here that she has quite choreic movements. She's, the Korea comes from the Greek word to dance. She's also got twisting dystonic movements and she has cognitive impairment and a progressive psychiatric disorder. This is a boy I looked after with juvenile Huntington's disease. He's 16 in the time of this video. He developed the disease when he was 11. Standing behind me is his mum. Her husband died when she, he was 33. And Amar sadly died when he was 21. His sister also died of Huntington's disease. So Huntington's disease is a devastating disease of patients and families. This is from a recent review about preclinical therapeutic targets for Huntington's disease, and they're all outlined in gray. I'm going to focus on targeting DNA and RNA because I think that gives us the best chance of making a difference to the disease by targeting proximally. It doesn't then matter what the downstream pathogenic effects are because you're targeting right up at the beginning. So I'm going to talk to you about Huntington lowering. So this was from a review in Neuron in 2019, giving an overview of the different approaches in development for Huntington lowering. In my talk today, I'm going to talk to you about antisense oligonucleotides for Huntington's disease and also for wider neurodegenerative diseases. I'm also going to talk to you about zinc finger proteins targeting DNA. We have challenges in trying to find treatments for brain diseases. What do we treat with? When do we treat? Where do we treat? How? Is it going to be safe? And is it reversible? And can you titrate the dose? Lots of big asks. But we have the brain size issue in humans. This is a rodent brain. This brain is a small non-human primate, this is a large non-human primate, and this is the human brain. We have to develop drugs that target all of the human brain, and delivery and distribution of therapeutics is a huge challenge. In diseases, typically in neurodegeneration, they affect the whole brain. So antisense oligonucleotide therapy in Huntington's disease. ASOs are single strands of chemically modified DNA. They've been designed to bind to their cognate mRNA through Watson and Crick base pairing. And that binding leads to a hybrid that is degraded through the RNA's H1 mechanism. And the result of that is that you get less protein being made. ASOs are chemically modified to allow them to be diffusible, dose dependent, stable, and reversible. And this is the chemistry of MOE ASOs. This is the 20 base pair oligo. They have an MOE moiety at either side that gives affinity, stability, and tolerability. They have a phosphodiester phosphothiate linked backbone that allows recognition through the RNA's H1 mechanism. MOE ASOs do not cross the blood brain barrier, so you need to give them intrathecally via a lumbar puncher. They have long half-lives in CNS tissue with longer duration of action, so you can have infrequent dosing. The major questions for the original ASO preclinical development was could an ASO be designed that specifically reduces Huntington and improves models? Is a non-allele specific approach viable? Is the ASO safe in preclinical toxicology studies? And does intrathecally delivered ASO distribute well to brain regions affected by Huntington's disease? The answers from the preclinical work to all of this was yes, and I'm going to show you a little bit of this data. 
This is data from uh, one of the mouse models, so a three mouse models start study. This is the Yak 128 HD mouse. This is the uh, motor uh, latency to fall. And then in blue is the ASO treated animals. And you can see here that the ASO treated animals at five months of age had pr complete protection against motor impairment. This is showing lowering of the, a of the um, Huntington with the ASO in the animals. In the R62 mouse, there was increased survival. And in the back HD mice, there was some improvement in clinical phenotypes of the mouse. This is some of the preclinical work that was done in macaques. Now, this models the design of the phase one trial that we took forward. The animals were dosed monthly for over four months with intrathecally delivered Huntington ASO. This is Huntington levels, and these are brain regions. You can see here there's very good lowering in the frontal cortex and the occipital cortex, about 50% lowering in the deep structures of the caudate and the thalamus. We also did large animal Yucatan pig work where they have spinal cords that are about 50 centimeters to show that an intrathecal dosed delivery had good lowering predominantly in the cortex, but some in the deep structures. The ASO has a predominant cortical pharmacodynamic effect. There was a 10-year preclinical program that started in 2005 and finished in 2015. The ASO's decreased Huntington RNA and protein in HD rodent models, correcting some aspects of phenotype and improving survival. Intrathecal bolus administration in multiple large animals gave broad distribution and activity. The toxicology program, which lasted up to 15 months, identified a wide safety margin in non-human primates. And the non-human primate PKPD model was developed to relate changes in CSF mutant Huntington to changes in brain mutant Huntington. And the toxicology program was done in multiple species. And the 15-month data was from non-human primates. The major questions for the development of the drug was, would it be safe and well tolerated in HD patients? Could we get any evidence of target engagement in a short, small study? And what was the best study designed to answer this? And in September 2015, the first HD patient received the first ASO targeting Huntington mRNA to enter clinical testing. It was a first in human multiple ascending dose study design. We had five dose levels versus placebo, three to one active to placebo with the drug given through an intrathecal fast push bolus lumbar puncture. The primary objective was safety and tolerability. The doses were 10, 30, 60, 90 and 120 uh, or placebo. They got four doses over three months and followed up for four months afterwards, so a short seven-month study. They all had stage one early Huntington's disease and were well matched for age, gender, and CAG repeats. This was the result that people got excited about. This was CSF mutant Huntington change from baseline to the last available 28-day post-dose time point. This is CSF mutant Huntington at endpoint. And you can see here a dose dependent lowering of the target CSF mutant Huntington. At the 90 and 120 milligram doses, there was between 40 to 60% lowering. We know from preclinical work that CSF mutant Huntington that we measure is coming from the brain. And the PKPD model I mentioned was used to predict mutant Huntington reduction. This was a non-human primate PKPD model to link what we measured in CSF to brain mutant Huntington, which we cannot measure in patients. So a CSF lowering of 40% was predicted to give 55 to 70% lowering in the cortex and 20 to 35% in caudate. 60% lowering was predicted to give 70 to 85% in the cortex and 35 to 50% in the caudate. The magnitude of reduction exceeds the amount that was effective in HD animal models, which is about 30 to 50% mutant Huntington lowering. The conclusions from the first study was that Tominersen, which is the current name for the ASO, was well tolerated at all doses tested. 
There was significant dose-dependent reduction of mutant Huntington in CSF. The trial was the first demonstration of antisense-mediated protein suppression in the CNS of patients with a neurodegenerative disease. And the open-label extension was underway and investigating the effects of sustained mutant Huntington lowering. Some insights from the 15-month open-label extension. The subjects from the original study, this is shown here in orange, were rolled over to get Tominersen every four weeks versus Tominersen every eight weeks via intrathecal delivered lumbar puncture. This is CSF mutant Huntington change from baseline on the y-axis, and this is visit day on the x. And you can see here a 70% mean trough lowering at 15 months with four weekly dosing, and at eight weekly dosing, a 44% mean trough lowering. The target range is 30 to 50% lowering. And this data shows that eight weekly dosing is sufficient to reach the target CSF mutant Huntington reduction. CSF neurofilament levels increased in the eight weekly arm. They also increased in the four weekly arm by a greater amount. But in the eight weekly arm, they spiked up at day 141 and then started coming back down towards baseline. In orange is untreated patients, and you get about a 15% increase at 15 months of neurofilament light. The mechanism underlying the neurofilament increase is currently under mechanistic further investigation. It could be on-target effects, off-target effects, or ASO chemical effects. The eight-weekly regime also appeared more suitable for chronic dosing than the four-weekly based on tolerability and safety. This is the four-weekly and this is the eight-weekly, and this is the safety and tolerability data. In the four-weekly, there were seven serious adverse events and two SUSARs, sudden unexpected serious adverse reactions. In the eight-weekly group, there were no serious adverse events and no sudden unexpected serious adverse reactions. So the eight-weekly was more suitable for chronic dosing, and there were no ASO class risks associated. So this led to the design of the Generation HD1 study, which was to evaluate the efficacy and safety of intrathecally administered tominersin in adult patients with manifest Huntington's disease. This was a multi-center, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial in 18 countries at 100 study sites, with 791 symptomatic HD patients recruited. It was testing 120 milligrams of tominersin every eight weeks versus tominersin 120 milligrams every 16 weeks versus placebo for 25 months. On the 22nd of March, at nine o'clock in the evening UK time, Roche put out this press release. This dosing was asked to stop in the phase three clinical study of tominersin following a recommendation from an independent data monitoring committee. There were no new safety signals identified for Tominersen in the IDMC review. The decision was based on the results of a pre-planned review of the data from the phase three study conducted by an unblinded, completely independent data monitoring committee. And the IDMC made its recommendation based on the investigational therapies potential benefit risk profile for study participants. So I'm recording this talk on the 29th of March, and we don't yet know of the data that drove this decision, but clearly it was a devastating decision for the patients and families, and it is important that we understand the reasoning for it once we can see the data. This is the current status of the Tom and Nurse and Clinical Development Programme, the HD natural history study is ongoing, but the dosing has been paused in those who have rolled over into Gen Extend. In the Generation Extend rollover study, dosing has been paused pending assessment of further data. The Generation HD1 study is stopped in accordance with the IDMC recommendation, but the patients are going to continue to be followed up for safety and any efficacy readouts. 
I am now going to share with you my current thinking on of why the trial could be stopped. Now, bear in mind, I'm recording this one week after the trial was stopped, but I'm sharing with you my thoughts. Halting of the program may have been due to a safety concern, lack of benefit, or both. Safety could be related to the previous issues that led to the dropping of the Q4 arm in the open label extension, which I showed you. Possible safety issues. Exposure. Was the 120 milligram ASO dose chosen too high and too frequent, the 8 weekly and 16 weekly? Were there chemical effects of the ASO? This is also related to exposure. For example, sterile inflammation with raised white count and, inf uh, and protein in CSF, resulting in altered CSF flow in neurodegenerating brain tissue. non selective approach. Tominersen lowers both wild type and mutant Huntington, and it may be we need to aim only for mutant Huntington lowering. The preclinical safety data showed that lowering of wild type Huntington by 50% in non human primates up to 15 months was completely safe. And there's a large body of preclinical data suggesting this is safe. However, this may be a possible safety issue. Lack of efficacy could be disease stage. By the time patients have manifest disease, there is overt neurodegeneration with over 50% of the striatum lost and a large body of the cortex, cortex lost. Do we need to lower Huntington earlier, perhaps before symptom onset, to make any difference to the neurodegenerating process? I think this is likely. Distribution in brain. ASOs have predominant cortical effects and the deep structures are less well covered. Huntington exon 1 related toxicity, which I think is important, is not covered by this ASO, which is targeting full length mutant and wild type Huntington. I think it's likely to be a combination of effects, and we are hoping to get the answers from the data in the weeks to come. And we will learn from this, and we, the learnings will move on to trials of different agents and possibly also new studies with Tom and Erson. We are able to move forward with developing therapies targeting the mutant Huntington protein only. It is more challenging and approaches in development with ASOs or with Ionis and WAVE. This is personalized genomic medicine with ASOs targeting subjects who carry specific SNPs that are linked to the mutant allele. It can treat a subset of the HD population and you need five different ASOs to treat all of the HD population. The antisense approach targets SNPs and you have to target SNPs that are associated and linked to the CAG expansion, i.e. associated with the mutant allele. So patients are genotyped and then checked whether the SNP links to the mutant allele and then they can be treated with the ASO. This is the WAVE approach. They have two trials in phase one, precision HD1 and precision HD2. They're targeting SNPs associated with the long CAG. The trial of SNP1 and SNP2 has uh, released data last year showing a 16 milligram dose resulted in 12% lowering of CSF mutant Huntington. And they've now increased the dose to 32 milligrams. And there will also be open label data. And we expect that data, hopefully, in the next quarter of 2021. I'm also going to talk to you about a new transcriptional repressor zinc finger protein allele selective gene therapy program that I am very involved in taking forward. Gene therapy is a technique that uses genetic material to treat or prevent disease using a viral capsid with a DNA expression cassette to allow continuous production of a therapeutic molecule. It is theoretically a single shot it has the disadvantages that it's not reversible like ASOs. When you stop dosing ASOs, the effects are mitigated within about four to eight weeks. Gene therapy is a single shot, but there, are not an, there is no off switch. Gene therapy in the brain 
particularly use AAV delivered viruses to deliver the gene therapy. And so engineered zinc finger proteins for allele-specific repression of mutant hunting transcription. Now, I think this is an exciting approach because it targets Huntington DNA. So it targets the full-length mutant Huntington, and it also targets alternatively spliced exon-1 transcripts, which we know are toxic in preclinical models. So the ZFP has been designed and engineered to preferentially bind longer CAG repeats and promote the recruitment of multiple zinc finger protein rep fusion proteins at the expanded disease allele. The rep functional domain inhibits transcription when recruited to the Huntington gene by the zinc finger protein. It's the zinc finger protein transcriptional repressor then switches off at the transcription start site and prevents transcription. This is data published in 2019 showing the zinc finger protein lowers mutant Huntington selectively in vivo and reverses aspects of phenotype. This was striatal injection into the Q175 mice. This shows that you get mutant allele specific lowering what mRNA and protein level. This data shows that you get reversal of perinuclear and nuclear inclusions with treatment with the ZFP. And this is micro PD10 PET. And PD10 loss in the striatum is associated with Huntington's disease. And this is a functional readout showing that the, the ZFP treatment reversed some of the PD10 loss in the striatum. So this is a functional reversal of some of the PD10 loss in the striatum. So now the discovery of TAC 686. 1,600 ZFP transcriptional repressors were tested in human cell lines. The top five AAV ZFP transcriptional repressors were tested in vivo and the top candidates selected based on pharmacology. And this is TAC 686. These graphs show dose dependent reduction of soluble mutant Huntington for at least 33 weeks after a single dose of TAC 686 in Q175 mice. This is the clinical development program. The therapeutic goal for us is a single administration to slow down disease progression in HD by lowering mutant Huntington only. It's going to be via an intraparenchymal brain infusion. Initially, we're going to target adults with early stage one patients in the first in human study with the primary endpoint of safety. We're going to administer it via MRI guided and convection enhanced delivery to the caudate and the putamen. And the IND enabling GLP TOX study is currently ongoing. And we hope to start this trial if the toxicology data looks good in 2022. So, other neurological disorders targeted by ASOs. I'm now going to tell you the story of spinal muscular atrophy and spin rasa. Spinal muscular atrophy is due to recessive mutations in the SMN1 gene, and the severity of the phenotype relates to the number of copies of SMN2. The type 1 infantile onset is the most severe. It is 60% of cases. Symptom onset is less than six months of age, and they have a very short life expectancy, not typical, beyond two years of age. Most of them have just two copies of the SMN2 gene. There is a type 2 later onset with three copies of the SMN2 gene. They're able to sit or stand, but not walk. The type 3 is have close to normal life expectancy with muscle weakness, however, and skeletal deformities. And they have most have three to four copies of the SMN2 gene. So Spinraza was designed by Frank Bennett and Adrian Craner. And they won the Breakthrough Brain Prize for Nusinersen or Spinraza. This is an ASO that targets splicing. And the ASO targets splicing of exon 7 in the SMN2 pre-mRNA. So non-functional SMN2 has the exon 7 missing. But full-length SMN2 has the uh, exon 7 incorporated. And that gives a full-length functional SMN2 protein.
So Newson Ursin was designed to modulate splicing and allow incorporation of exon 7. So basically, it's upregulating the level of a missing good protein. This was the uh, phase three trial, the INDEAR trial, which was published. And actually, this trial resulted in quite a lot of excitement because the trial had an interim analysis and the trial was halted at the interim analysis because it was no longer ethical to continue with the sham procedure group. And this is why. This is the percentage of motor milestone responders. This is the sham group. And this is Nusenersen. And you can see there's a huge difference in sham versus active. The trial was stopped. And within three months, the FDA approved Spinraza as a treatment for infantile SMA. And this graph shows you these trials all on one graph. This is motor milestones of the children. This is days of visits. This is the original phase one open label study in red with the children all improved. This is the Endear study here, and you can see the children with active improved and those with sham did not. And the reason I want to show you this graph is because of this graph. This is the Nurture study. So prenatal testing is done for uh, parents who've had an affected child with SMA, and you can screen for subsequent children for the mutations that cause SMA. The children were then offered, the parents were offered just after birth in the neonatal period to be offered Nusenersen or Spinraza. What happened is quite remarkable. In the nurture study, these infants had normal motor milestone development and never developed infantile spinal muscular atrophy. So this is an example of pre-symptomatic treatment resulting in an essential cure of the disease. And this gives us hope for neurodegeneration and that we want to be able to treat as early as possible, like the success they've had in SMA. I'm going to show you another uh, ASO trial. This is for familial ALS due to genetic changes in the SOD1 gene. And mutations in SOD1 have been identified as a genetic cause of ALS. And there are many pathological variants, and they're hypothesized to increase toxic aggregation of SOD1. This is the phase one, two clinical results of the SOD1 antisense drug Terfersin. And these results have just been come out. This is a study day of treatment. This is the change from baseline of CSF SOD1 concentration. This is the 100 milligram dose. And in gray is the placebo. You can see here. There was no change in placebo, but clear lowering of SOD1 in the CSF in the 100 milligram dose. Now, ALS is a rapidly progressive disease, and this is the ALS functional rating scale, which measures speech, swallowing, and function. And this is the mean change from baseline. In gray is the placebo group, which deteriorated over 85 days, and in blue is the tofersin group, which looks like they've stabilized. And a phase three trial is now underway in familial ALS. This was published in July 2020 of the Tofersin trial for SOD1 ALS. There are also trials currently undertake, being undertaken to selectively reduce tau. Now, tau is a contributor or cause of several neurodegenerative diseases, which are characterized by abnormal tau protein in neurons and non-neuronal cells. The most commonly known is Alzheimer's disease, but it's also associated with forms of frontal temporal dementia. There is a phase one, two study ongoing with the tau ASO in patients with Alzheimer's disease and a phase two, three study planned in tau-related FTD frontal temporal dementia. So watch this space. This was from a review from last year where I gave an overview of the approaches to reduce pathological protein production with antisense oligonucleotides by targeting mutations or SNPs, by targeting splice sites, targeting translation start sites to reduce the amount of toxic proteins which are commonly associated with neurodegenerative diseases. Spinraza had a different mechanism of action that was upregulating the level of a good protein. 
So the relevance of intrathecally delivered ASO for brain diseases. Sadly, the Huntington's program is paused awaiting further analysis. Spinraza is an approved treatment for SMA. The SOD1 trial is in phase three. There are now trials in early phases for C9 of 72 for ALS. Tau in, is in clinical development for Alzheimer's disease and tauopathies. LARC2 and alpha synuclein in development for Parkinson's. Spinocerebellar ataxia type 1, 2, and 3 targeting ASOs are in development and also prion protein. So the question is, will ASOs be a potential revolution in treatment of otherwise untreatable brain diseases? And I have to say, we don't know yet. It clearly, for Spinraza, a neuromuscular disease, we're upregulating the level of a missing protein. It's been a revolution. But in terms of diseases that are brain diseases associated with protein aggregation, we need to see if ASOs lowering the level of toxic proteins are going to be beneficial. I don't think the Huntington's program is over. I think there's a lot of potential for ASOs in Huntington's disease, but we've got work to do to try and analyze the data and find what are the possibilities that resulted in the, in the um, trial being stopped. I'm going to finish with showing you that antisense therapies can have N of 1 studies with a personalized genomic medicine approach. Now, this was a molecular diagnosis of a rare fatal neurodegenerative disease called Batten's disease in a six-year-old girl. This led to the rational design testing and manufacture of Millicen. This was a splice modulating ASO tailored to this particular child. This is the timeline from the clinical diagnosis to the identification of the mutation, establishment of cell lines, identifying the splice defect, identifying an ASO hit, then going forward, validating it in rats, and moving forward to the first patient dosing. The mutation in the girl caused abnormal MFSD8 splicing and translation. And the ASO was designed and screened to boost the normal splicing and correct the missplicing event which led to premature translational termination of the mRNA of MFSD8. The ASO was given to the child intrathecally and improved the clinical phenotype. And this is the report that was in the New England Journal of Medicine. This is an example of true N of 1 personalized genomic medicine. For Huntington's disease, my goal in the future is I want to be able to do clinical trials in young HD gene carriers decades before symptom onset. And we published just last year in the Lancet Neurology a cohort of individuals 25 years before onset who were essentially functionally completely normal. And I think if we can intervene at that stage within a therapeutic, we may be able to preserve healthy neurons prevent disease occurring, and we may be like SMA and the Nurture trial, prevent onset of the disease completely. And that's our hope for the future. And I'm going to finish with a quote. It's been a tough week following the closing down of the HD phase three trial. And we're going to have a lot to learn, and we will learn from that. And it will result in further developments. It will also result in more understanding of the ASO biology and chemistry. So it was a harder day's journey than yesterday's, for there were long and weary hills to climb. And in journeys as in life, it is a great deal easier to go downhill than up. However, they kept on with unabated perseverance, and the hill has not yet lifted its face to heaven. That perseverance will not gain the summit of at last. And basically, we just have to keep on fighting and working to find treatments for neurodegeneration. I'd like to thank you for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions. Great, Sarah. Thank you for that very, it's a tour de force, a very honest and open opinion, and clearly some of the news is very disappointing for the um, Huntington's community and for yourself and your team. But actually, as you said, uh, it, these are opportunities, and I think we have to learn from them. And Actually, I think a sign of the talk, quite a few questions have come in already, which we'll pose to you. I just thought I'd um, kick off because 
I mean, it's obviously the logical thing. There were so many secondary mechanisms for cell death in HD is just take out the mutant um, allele at, at, at its site. Um, seemed like a great idea. I think you are hampered kind of asking some of these questions because you won't have a huge amount of data back um, about the reasons or the or why the study was paused. But like everything in life, we, we move forward and we learn. And actually, I have to say, if anyone's going to get over that highest peak, uh, in my experience, it'll probably be you. So I don't think you should be too disheartened. What do you think you've learned about this? Because everything seemed really good from the preclinical and even the you know, safety phase one trial. Yeah, what yeah, it's a really good question. So I haven't seen the data yet. So the unblinded data from the IDMC has now gone to Roche, um, who are analyzing it internally. And then over the next few weeks, then that I will um, have the opportunity to see the data. The um, biofluid analysis of CSF mutant Huntington and CSF neurofilament um, will take much longer because it all has to be assayed. So I don't know the reasons yet. Um, however, um, the, the, the thoughts that I gave are, um, uh, uh, and I'll uh, just say a bit more about that. You're absolutely right. So the excitement about this was that Huntington's is a genetic dementia, mutant Huntington causes the disease, and we know that we lowered the toxic mutant Huntington in CSF. So all good. Now, in the phase one study, in the high dose 120 milligrams, there was a suggestion of an increase uh, uh, in CSF neurofilament. Now that was, um, uh, so, and there was also a suggestion of an increase in ventricular um, uh, enlargement. So in the open label extension, the four week and eight weekly were tested. Now the four week dose of 120 milligrams, and it was chosen because there was a big hope not to underdose and to go for the 120 milligram dose, which was the highest dose tested in the phase one. And there were no safety con uh, concerns in that. So, um, but the four weekly dose was stopped because of safety and tolerability and adverse events. Um, and uh, there was increases in white count and protein and CSF, which was suggestive of a sterile inflammation. In the eight weekly dose, as I showed you, it went on for chronic dosing. And that was the dose chosen in Tom and Erson versus the 16 weekly dose. And um, what I think may be happening is that ASOs are very hydrophobic molecules. We're delivering them into the CNS. Um, the 120 milligram dose was the highest dose tested. It's a high dose, uh, but we're trying to lower the level of a, of a protein. So I think, I, I think exposure and dose uh, uh, is probably, is, is my thoughts that may be an issue. Uh, I do think that by the time people have got manifest disease, stage one and stage two Huntington's disease, they're very disabled by stage two. There's a 60% loss of the striatum and 30% loss of the cortex. And then you put in a high dose of a hydrophobic antisense molecule into a brain that is already sick, and I think that's that's not good. And I think that's what the CSF neurofilament spike that we saw was. I do um, uh, uh, also, we don't, the, the, the reason it was stopped is that they obviously didn't see a benefit in the dosing. So it might be that uh, uh, we need to learn more about non-allele selective approaches. Uh, uh, sorry, about allele selective approaches. This was a non-allele selective approach and targeting the mutant gene is, is very challenging for lots of reasons. And after my um, talk was recorded, those of you, some of you may know that the WAVE program that I mentioned targeting uh, SNPs in a subset of the population was actually stopped. And the reason it was stopped was their phase one, two study data showed that the um, ASOs did not lower mutant Huntington at all. 
So there was no evidence of target engagement with SNP1 or SNP2, and so they stopped that program. So obviously that was very um, bad news coming along after it. So I think, um, I mean, I could probably talk for hours on the possible reasons, um, uh, uh, and uh, it's obviously we've got, we're short of time, but I, I think the most important thing from this is that we will learn from the data, we will understand it, we may have to go back into a pre-manifest trial where there is much less neurodegeneration. We will likely have to go at lower doses, but I think we have to understand the whole pharmacology and the uh, data to be able to design possibly another trial, but also to inform all trials in neurodegeneration with antisense, because this is going to be relevant for everyone um, in terms of this trial was the first big phase three. So lots of learning and i am absolutely committed to sharing that learning with the community i want this i want um uh, uh, this to uh help to provide new opportunities great Sarah. and lots of questions coming in as you probably would have predicted and if if anything will lift you from the the little bit of gloom that is around these clouds i would suggest afterwards you just read some of the messages people put there i won't read them out for him shake shake or for embarrassing you and possibly the people who've said nice things about you um so a couple of questions um one uh from tom otis which you've semi answered already about um the do you know are there dose limiting factors to prevent going above 120 at eight weeks um and obviously the holy grail are there any pre-symptomatic trials planned yet so both great questions um 120 was the maximum dose in the phase one and i think um, based on the, uh, uh, and we know we get very good CSF mutant Huntington lowering with that, but I think based on the phase three, and then of course we will see the data, Tom, is that the 120 milligrams eight weekly or the 120 milligrams um, uh, uh, may just have been too high. They also did, we had also had loading in the uh, in the phase three because the pharmacologists um, at Roche were very keen to get maximum lowering, um, which is what pharmacologists are interested in is getting most target engagement. So I think what we're gonna have to do is dial back a bit more. The, and what's interesting about this trial, the phase one, two was so successful that it, Roche took it straight to a phase three with no interim dose finding study. Now, with the benefit of a lot of hindsight, and hindsight's always useful, and taking two or three years to do a dose finding study may have been useful, but the data from the phase one, two was so good that it powered the design of a phase three. But uh, I think pre-symptomatic trials are on the cards, but we need to try and understand why the phase three stopped and design that study as a dose finding study. I'm interested in doing it as a dose finding study with something like CSF neurofilament as a readout, which uh, 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 would be a good readout over a short period of time as a biomarker. But it's a very good question, Tom, and, and a very active one at this moment. Yeah, and another one just about the design of the study is from um, Emma Enel. I think I've got your surname right. Um, uh, obviously disappointing news. What do you think um, the retention of those already in the trial will be continue to monitor even though dosing has stopped? Do you think? Um, so it's a really good question. So when we got the news that uh, Monday night, we had an emergency steering committee meeting and everyone thought the patients wouldn't want to stay in because they have to c continue getting lumbar punches. But what really moved me and, uh, uh, I, I, I ha and I talked to 800 patients and families on the Friday after the, the result, what really moved me is the dedication of our H Huntington's patients and families because they all want to stay in the trial. They all want to keep being uh, uh, tested, uh, analyzed, they agreed to all keep getting lumbar punches in an altruistic way for us to help understand more about effects of the drug and then off the drug. So uh, they, they've all agreed to continue being in the study. And I think it's testament to the resilience of the Huntington's patients and families. I, I, I think they're amazing. And they all said in this big 800 person meeting I had, is that they're really glad the trial happened because 
it was a huge step forward. It gave a massive amount of hope and it will help d design other trials. This is, you know, when we were trying to find treatments for when cancer biologists were trying to find treatments for cancer in the 70s, they had to test a lot of chemotherapy agents before they came up with therapies that actually now can cure cancer. And that's where I think we are in neurodegeneration, um, in that we are in the, going to learn a lot and use that to design um, uh, new studies. But a lot of trials failed early on in cancer chemotherapy trials and very similar. Um, and so we may, um, uh, we'll follow and learn from that. So yes, uh, um, it's the patients and families are very keen to stay involved. Yeah, I mean, I have to say, HD families are the most motivated <clears throat> group of patients I've, I think I've uh, met. Yeah, after I spoke to this 800 patients and families, I was really very moved, nearly, well, really moved to tears, actually. They were amazing, and they were so grateful that something was happening and really, really hopeful. So we that keeps you inspired to keep fighting. I'm absolutely dedicated to this. Right, I've got to keep playing through. Um, Annette Dolphin. Um, any other way antisense could be delivered, perhaps IV, in a sort of pr more protected manner? So it's a good question, Annette. So antisense has been given peripherally for a number of peripheral diseases. Um, it's got a very um, uh, effective um, treatment for um, uh, TTR, um, amyloid um, accumulation, and that's given via the liver. So uh, um, if an antisense is given intravenously or subcutaneously, it tends to be cleared very quickly to the liver, then gets cleared through the kidneys. <clears throat> so a number of approaches have been trying to use that to get to the brain, but the levels that get to the brain with an intravenous injection is negligible. And MOE ASOs don't cross the blood-brain barrier. People are trying to develop conjugated linkers to get ASOs across the blood-brain barrier, but so far they've not been successful. So I think I think that, that they're still going to have to be delivered intrathecally, um, but I think we will have to think of ways of delivering them and increasing their potency and half-life such that they can be delivered every six months and also possibly delivered via shunts um, and catheters rather than repeated lumbar punches. It might be in the future that a shuttle that gets them across the blood-brain barrier uh, can be developed, but there are many different approaches to that's tried to test that that so far have been unsuccessful, but it's a very good question. I'm just gonna stray you away from um, the ASOs for a minute. We'll come back to some of the questions, but um, Giovanna Lali says, how specific is zinc finger protein approach? Um, are there any risks of transcriptional inhibition off target in the long term? Um, is the level of zinc finger protein expression critical? Yeah, so it's, it's a very good question, Giovanna. So the zinc finger protein, as you know, are relatively new uh, ways of suppressing uh, 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 gene expression, a bit like uh, similar to CRISPR, but this is a, um, a, a transcriptional repressor. So um, in non-human primate RNA-seq, we did a lot of uh, work with the RNA seq to look at off target effects to other CAG bind uh, region, uh, genes that contain CAGs because the zinc finger binds to an expanded CAG, so it binds to a, a, any CAG. So the off target effects were actually very clean. And uh, so the program was taken forward um, and is now in uh, non human primate testing uh, for GLP tox. So uh, that is going to be the most important piece of data over the next six months. It's also being tested in mini pigs, which are actually not mini. They're very large pigs with a large animal distribution. So it, we're going to see what the safety looks like in the large pig data, as well as distribution um, uh, and lowering, as well as the non-human primates. But you're right, um, Giovanna, there is, you know, there are, there are, potential safety concerns about ZFPs um, and transcriptional repression, but it's it's a if it works and it targets DNA and it tar and it's allele specific and it's a single shot, then it would be a massive achievement. But I think there's a lot to get to to get there. And I think there are cons obviously ongoing concerns regarding potential off target effects. Okay, um, they're still coming in. Uh, Alex Stewart, do you expect similar concerns to arise from ASOs targeting 
functional MRI such as tau so yeah it's a good question well. so the aso against tau is is targeting um uh normal functional tau so i i am not i have to say here i'm not an alzheimer's or ftd expert so um uh but i think it's going to be the similar issues in in when you're targeting uh uh proteins that um also have normal functions and it's the same with huntington's disease targeting total huntington so we target wild type which which is important but we don't want to lower it too much and it's also targeting the mutant now we know in hd that if we can get the mutant down we know in preclinical models and preserve uh, uh, and keep enough of the wild type then the animals are okay and actually they benefit so I think it's the same. It'll have the same issues for targeting the normal functional proteins like tau. So uh, the the um, safety monitoring for that will have to um, monitor any adverse events from lowering um, uh, wild type functional tau. But I think that's the big challenge in neurodegeneration as well, is that many of the approaches just because of the chemistry, um, uh, are targeting functional proteins. It's the same in Alzheimer's for ASOs in development targeting APP. So they're going to lower APP, which may, may uh, uh, have effects downstream on, on reducing amyloid burden, but it will also lower functional wild type APP. So it's a very good question, and it's a big area, I think, for uh, for specul well, it's not speculation for research and understanding. And I think the Huntington program, you know, it you know, it might have been also lowering the wild type protein um, uh, uh, may have had adverse, <laughs> maybe additive in adverse events because it's a neuroprotective protein. Yeah, and then sort of down the same line, sort of a bit blue skying. There's two questions, but there's I think they're on the same target. Um, Mikhail van der Swan and Maya Hansborn. Mikhail says, um, "Do you think there's any future uh, future for com combining multiple ASOs to be used to treat diseases where there are multiple risk genes?" And Maya brings up the question, of, which I think is the same topic. Really, the approach can be readily applied to sporadic cases of neurodegenerative disease. So I guess where you've got multiple risk alleles. Yeah, so, um, so it's, this, it's a it's a really good question, and I think it, you know it's a bit like cancer again, and I use that analogy a lot now. Um, uh, but they need three or four chemotherapy agents to target treatments for cancer. We have the challenges. This is the brain. I think in Huntington's, I'll use that as an example. I think we're going to need multiple approaches. I think we're going to need something that targets exon one. I think something that also targets full length mutant Huntington. And um, uh, it might, and ASOs have a cortical predominant effect, pharmacodynamic effect. So we, we will need something like that to target the cortex, something to target the striatum, like a single shot gene therapy, and it'll be multiple different approaches. So antisense oligonucleotides can be combined. That hasn't been done yet experimentally um, at the moment because. Um, you then have to double the dose of, of, a, of a potentially hydrophobic, potentially pro-inflammatory molecule. But it is an approach that's of interest. Um, all of the approaches for sporadic diseases like Parkinson's, um, and I mentioned Alzheimer's, are approaching by targeting LARP2 and alpha-synuclein, both proteins involved in the pathogenesis, but both functional proteins in their own right. It's like tau and APP for Alzheimer's disease. And uh, it's a bit like the SOD1 for ALS. That was targeting normal SOD1, but actually it was beneficial in reducing um, SOD1 uh, uh, in these SOD1 mutation carrying patients. So the, the treatment for sporadic diseases may in the future involve multiple ASOs against multiple proteins, but I think we, there'll have to be quite a bit of work with them individually before before getting there um uh, and clearly what we learn from the huntington program will will help these sporadic neurodegenerative diseases caused by multiple risk genes yeah um now we're you're, you're we're you're maybe pleased to know we're beginning to run out of time i think we've got chance for one more i know there are a couple more questions which we may not have covered apologies to those sarah may be able to get online and answer them 
uh, later on the day. And this one is an existential question from Sarah Guthrie. Um, do you think ASOs are the most promising therapeutic road to overall question mark? Is it worth putting so much energy into understanding the pathways to neurodegeneration at the protein level then? Or should we be focusing all our efforts on understanding the genetics? That's so. a great question. <laughs> yeah, um, bear in mind uh, you've got two minutes. <laughs> yeah, I've got two minutes. Okay. For Huntington's disease, it's a genetic dementia. You never get the disease if, if you don't express have mutant the mutant gene and you have mutant protein. But the pathways to, to disease are complex. We know that exon one fragments, uh, alternatively spliced fragments, play an important role. So are you absolutely right, Sarah? D understanding the pathogenic pathways are absolutely key. Um, and, and, and diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, I think it's pivotal before designing um, uh, particular trials. I think for Huntington's disease, I still very much am focused on targeting the DNA and RNA because I just believe that if we can stop expression of toxic exon one of the full length mutant protein, um, if we can get it allele selective, then I think we will have a chance of treating the disease if we treat early enough in neurodegeneration. And I think we'll have to treat presymptomatically. So I do think that they uh, that's the approach, particularly for Huntington's disease. But I absolutely agree with you. We have to understand all the downstream pathogenic mechanistic pathways, very importantly in diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and ALS. I think without that, you can't intelligently design ways of, of intervening because you want to know what uh, uh, genetic proteins are playing a role. And then you want to potentially lower that level. Yeah. Um, good answer, Sarah, to a good question. Um, I think we're about to be cut off. So if there are, Sarah, have a look at the chat later because it's very worth your own self-esteem. Um, thank well, you very much for thank a you. fantastic lecture, which I know a lot of people found quite inspirational. We're about to be cut off. So thanks, everyone, for listening, for really being proactive in the questions. I'm sure there's more to run on this story. Thank uh, you. And thank you for wonderful questions. And uh, Thank you to everyone for their support. Thank you. All the best. Thanks, Tom. Thank you.